Thank you very much. How far do you think a child can go in his life or her life when the right to play is taken away? Every Thursday used to be an important day for me and my younger sister. It marked the beginning of the weekend. We would put on our play clothes and go outside for a game of street soccer. We grew up in the 10th section of Hebron, a city in the southern Palestinian territories, where at some points of my childhood, curfews were imposed by a strong military presence. Despite the fact that we were growing up under occupation, peace to us as kids meant our right to play freely, to have fun, and to feel safe. Then one evening, we were so involved in our game that we forgot about the curfew until an army jeep sped toward us as we scattered and tried to hide. The soldiers caught us. They took us home. And we witnessed our mother being ordered to keep us in the house. As young children, our view of the world, the street, which was our playground, was changing. That street, which could be seen from my window, our only neighborhood play space, shaped future dream for me, for my peers, and for my region. In my dreams, children were free to play, and I would help create the change to make it happen. Something inside me needed to be heard. A voice was calling for me to do something. But I was asking myself, how could an eight or nine year old child make it happen? I didn't know that I could give a voice to my dreams. Then, my life was changed by a man I never met. I'll never forget my mother's admiration of a Palestinian TV news journalist working for Reuters in Hebron. His name was Mazen Da'na. And he was physically attacked by soldiers while covering the tenth part of my city. I can still see him holding his camera, facing danger, facing the unknown, diving into the action. His camera lens made me feel that someone was telling a story I was living as a child. It gave the world an opportunity to bear witness and to take action on behalf of human rights and violations of international law. He made me believe in journalism as a tool to build bridges. Mazandana became my role model and my inspiration to become a journalist one day. I wanted to be the, ma the man, the voice, the man with the camera shooting the story with the lens, not with bullets. By the time I was 11, my city, Hebron, was invaded at the beginning of the second Palestinian uprising. I built my first camera, and the, the first lens I looked through was made of Legos. <laughs> Mazen was killed while filming for Reuters in Baghdad. He was shot by a US soldier. He was 42, I was 12. For me, it was time to take action. I started my own magazine at school, informing readers about the Israeli-Palestinian affairs, including violations against journalists, with news, articles, and photos. That magazine initiated debates at school about our position as youth with, with, with dreams of conflict-free life. I didn't know the meaning of being politi politically correct. And I didn't know that some teachers would object students discussing controversial issues. I had no idea how great an impact the act of raising voices would have on me and on my peers. At my age 15, it was the first time I held a camera 
I remember my hands shaking while taking the first picture of a group of soldiers patrolling the old city of Hebron. At that time, I broke my parents' rules and went down to cover tense clashes in downtown Hebron. I'm not sure if any of you have experienced tear gas bombs, but at that day, I survived being chugged from tear gas bombs. But when a young journalist sees that he can lead, at that time, he has to form a special path. The first week, I took office as an elected youth mayor in Hebron in 2006. I mobilized a group of youth to report news and to write our opinions in public. We called ourselves the Young Journalist Team, partnering with reporters based in Hebron. We Im implemented projects for teenagers to learn journalistic skills of writing and photography and filmmaking. One year later, we were able to secure two pages of coverage in the municipal newspaper for our young graduate journalists to post their interviews and articles. I can't describe to you how amazing and unique that feeling of seeing this forum of young voices reflecting different opinions and ambitious dreams. Over five years of operating since that time, thousands of students were involved in such programs. I can share with you the story of Jana Tahboub, a young graduate journalist of one of our programs, who says young voices exist, but they need the opportunity to learn how to be strengthened so they can speak out loudly and effectively. In my view, these voices, these young voices, our voices, represented a new future ambassador for peace, for change, and for the good of the world. When you have that experience, your lens actually becomes the way you define your responsibility toward your people in terms of our world. It becomes the way you see the world beyond borders, in, through your own eyes. Last year, while reporting on clashes and demonstrations in my city, Hebron, I was attacked by Israeli policemen. I had never experienced such a brutal physical attack and had never been in jail. For the first time, my hands and legs were being cuffed. It wasn't only a cuff that held my legs or hands. In my heart, I felt that my freedom of expression and my right to perform my duty were being cuffed. If holding my camera and opening my lens to record and show the world the conflict that I have been growing up, witnessing it, would lead me to jail. I was very proud to be there for the sake of defending the freedom of expression and our right to know and tell the story. I was feeling proud to feel that I'm keeping alive my hero, Mazen's mission. My six days in detention challenged me to rethink my commitment to my own message of peace and understanding. At first, I regretted every single moment I spent trying to understand the other side or care about a compromised solution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But then, I remember moments when I met my Israeli peers and saw that there was no difference in the way we perceived the future of our region. These moments made me believe in the potential of people working together to lead our region toward peace and prosperity. I can describe to you remembering some moments 
where not only there was no difference, but there was the same dreams in which we perceived our rules in this region. When I was released on the sixth day, and I realized the support of brothers and sisters from around the world, I learned one thing, our unlimited love, our unlimited understanding, and empathy with each other. Sharing efforts for the good of our nations, whatever was our nationalities, religions, or beliefs, is the right track for each one of us to take in this small world. My message is, let's allow our voices to speak and share our truth. Let's increase our ability to listen with compassion, to understand each other, so we can shorten the gap between our nations. You know why? Because there is one simple fact that unifies our generation. Our common longing for a peaceful world and our hope for a bright future for ourselves and our children. When I played in the streets of Hebron with my sister and that right was taken from us, I had no idea that that definition of peace I had formed as a child, the right to play, feel safe and have fun, would one day become a political definition. But it's a definition that we want to form by ourselves, not as we are told, by our hopes and our dreams. I want to tell you that we are able to achieve regional and global peace. We are able to do that by believing that we can bring our voices to a serious table and share who we are. I will raise my voice and I will tell you as I told my peers and as I still tell myself that we can work together and we can make a change for the good of our nations and our world. Thank you.